Welcome to XYPN Radio, where your host, Alan Moore, brings you into a community of fee-only financial planners who want to profitably and successfully serve Gen X and Gen Y clients. If you're ready to get the knowledge you need from leaders in your field, learn from forward-thinking advisors, and take action on your own goals, XYPN Radio is the show for you. Here's your host. Hello, and welcome to this episode of XYPN Radio. I'm your host, Alan Moore, and I'm excited to have Jen, XYPN's Director of Marketing, on the show today. Jen came to XYPN back in late 2016 and has really propelled the growth of XYPN through her expertise and passion for marketing. Pretty much everything you see uh, in relation to XY Planning Network comes directly from Jen. We talked about a range of topics in this episode, including how to come up with content that your ideal client uh, wants to hear, why building your list is critical, and the good and bad ways uh, to actually build it how to nurture your list so prospective clients eventually become actual clients, how to get mileage out of your content marketing efforts, how to use faux press releases to gain credibility, and where to spend your marketing dollars even if you don't have much to spend. We even talked through some of our quote-unquote secret marketing techniques at XYPN so you can see how we are putting everything Jen talks about in this episode into practice. If you're looking to learn marketing from a true expert, this episode is for you. Support for today's episode comes from Ruby Receptionist, the only live remote receptionist service dedicated to helping financial service professionals win more clients and build trust. With all you have going on, answering incoming calls may not always be a priority, but you can rely on Ruby to create exceptional experiences for your callers. From their offices in Portland, Oregon, Ruby's friendly professional receptionists answer calls live in English or Spanish, transfer calls, take messages, collect new client intake, and make follow-up calls, and more just like an in-house receptionist, but at a fraction of the cost. Never miss another opportunity due to a missed call. For a special offer, visit callruby.com slash XYPN and use promo code XYPN or call them at 1-844-853-7829. You can find any of the additional resources that we mentioned during the episode at xyplanningnetwork.com 139. Also, be sure to go to xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP to join our private group just for XYPN Radio listeners. It's the community of advisors we've all been looking for that's there to provide support when we need it the most. Best of all, it's free. I encourage you to check it out. Again, that's xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP. Without further ado, here's my interview with Jen. Hey, Jen, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for being on. Hi, Alan. Thanks for having me. So I'm excited because you have been at XY now about uh, almost a year and a half or uh, let's see, you started in in an October. So I guess that puts us at 14, 15 months now. Uh, and I haven't had you on the show yet. I, I'm honestly a little remiss that I haven't. Uh, and I feel that way about many of my guests now because I'm just like, I, I don't know, we have so many great people, but uh, I'm excited for, for you to be able to come on and, and share some of your uh, expertise and wisdom. So, so tell listeners a little bit about sort of your current role at XY Planning Network. Sure. I do all of the marketing um, that's uh, prospect facing, basically. So I'm tasked with bringing prospective advisors into our marketing funnel and the nurture phase of our marketing funnel. And then uh, eventually our prospects will engage with our sales team. All things we're going to talk about. Uh, and so I'm, I'm excited. So Give me just a little bit of sort of background on your career, sort of how you got into marketing. Has this always been your career? Sort of is this where you started out out of college? Sure, kind of. Um, college, I majored in mass communication. And my first role out of college, I did public speaking for a, a small private college, um, really got to help them scale up. I was the fourth person hired. Um, and I like to think of it as doing content marketing before the internet. And I, I don't wanna <laughs> <laughs> I don't wanna age myself here, but we I really remember the day on that job where when we got the internet in the office. <laughs> it's terrible. So how do you do content marketing when there's no internet? Um, what I did, I put together a public speaking program and I had a, a menu of topics that I would go out and present to high school students because that was the market we were going after for our college. Um, and we, our, our goal with this program was to establish credibility. So it's just like we do with content marketing. I, I, I wouldn't necessarily go out there and sell them on why the college was a, a great choice for them, but I would, I would impress them 
with the experience during the seminar, give them a lot of valuable information on things like resume writing or interview skills, life choices, that sort of thing. And uh, and then I would capture for nur- the nurture phase with a seminar evaluation. So they would um, give some feedback and then they would fill in their their name and address and phone number and whatnot. And, uh, no email address. No uh, <laughs> email addresses were, they made it onto the evaluation at one point eventually. <laughs> I did it for 10 years, so a lot changed. But yeah, and then I'd, I'd bring those leads back back to the office and the, the sales team would nurture them. So it, it was really uh, content marketing before the internet. You know, it's funny that that so clarifies the role of public speaker. Cause I remember uh, on your resume, it said like public speaker. And I was like, that's such a, I didn't know that was a job. Uh, <laughs> but to your point, that was sort of content marketing uh, before that was, you know, it was podcasting, right? It's all of these things that, that are, that, that sharing the content that you have in your head. Uh, and getting it out there. So you mentioned something interesting though, because you know a lot of financial advisors uh, I know are still relying on either seminars or, or some form of in-person public speaking. Uh, talk a little bit more about your choice of topics, because uh, I guess this can go two ways. I mean, on one hand, you don't want to get up there and, and just sell from the stage. It's not all, you know, me, 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 right? But then on the other side, there's this fear with all content marketing, I feel like, of giving away your secrets and telling too much. So how did you balance that? And sort of what was your approach to, you know, topics that you were willing to go talk to the high school students about? It's really the same with content marketing, no matter how how you do it, right? Um, it's a chance to earn some authority and to showcase your expertise. Um, I, I had one hour with these students per session. So give them as much value as you possibly can in an hour. And with any form of content marketing, when you're when you're trying to convert them to a customer, they're not coming to you for your, you know, general knowledge. They're coming to you for their help with their exact situation, right? So you can't um, you can't give them too much for free. It's always going to come back to what you can do for their exact situation. We talk a lot in the in the interview and sort of hiring process at XY about people's superpowers. Uh, I sort of pulled this from a book called The Alliance, which I love, uh, written by one of the co-founders of of LinkedIn, actually. And so I love how you talk about marketing. Like it's a, a known fact sometimes about things like you have to actually give, you know, helpful advice and not just be selling. And you have to be, you know, helping them with their specific problem, not just giving them general knowledge. But I think that's a struggle for a lot of advisors. Like, you know, I think this it, you you've spent enough time doing it now that this comes naturally to you. But for advisors, I think it's a struggle sometimes to know how how much to say. You know, what if I give them too much information? Then they don't feel like they need to hire me to be their financial advisor. Uh, whereas, you know, you and I are on the same page where it's like you couldn't possibly give them enough information to get there because they they always have Google, right? Like we don't know anything that's not on Google, so they can always go find the answer. Absolutely, yes. It's it's really. The nurture phase of the funnel, it's your chance to to really impress them with your knowledge. So then when they are ready to address their specific situation, they'll they'll come to you. You've already um, earned your your authority. So was that effective doing seminar marketing for high school students? I mean, was that an effective lead gen tool for, for your college? It was, yeah. I actually did it for 10 years until I, I left to try other opportunities, but uh, it it was uh, incredibly effective. Um, it, we would have not gotten where we were without a program like that because it, it really, uh, we got the not only the trust of the, the high school students and, and, you know, we established authority with them, but the gatekeepers, the schools, the, uh, the teachers, the principals, the guidance counselors, we, we got this audience, you know, our target market, exactly who we wanted to be in front of. Um, and th- they let us in, they welcomed us. And, you know, we did that by not giving a sales pitch when I was up in front of, of these students. It was really giving them something that was valuable to them, that their school felt good about. They, they felt like it was knowledge they needed to know. Now, the other thing I will add is I've never heard of a new private college with (laughs) five employees. So that's sort of a cool experience to get to start at the ground floor of what I would assume was sort of maybe a new take on college and education. Because, I mean, otherwise, why would you start start a college? Yeah, it was. And then, you know, through the years, they certainly grew and and built new campuses and uh, went through a couple acquisitions and yeah, it was a very interesting first job right out of college. So from there, after uh, after 10 years, I, I was looking for my next challenge. And 
I applied for a couple different jobs. One was for a, a, a to be a PR superstar, <laughs> and the other was to be uh, uh, the local director for a nonprofit. And so I kind of I had the PR superstar job was for a, a poker tour, and then it was this nonprofit. So I. I looked at it as like kind of this good girl job and this bad girl <laughs> job. <laughs> and I, I really debated. I had such a hard time trying to decide um, which direction I was going to go. And the, the nonprofit was definitely the better job on paper. Um, it just had better benefits and better hours and that sort of thing. But this poker tour just uh, it really spoke to me and just seemed like a, a lot of fun. And that's, that's the road that I took. And I did that for, uh, for six years. So it sounds to me, and of course, the fact that you came on at XY uh, later on in the story, it tells me that you just kind of like that startup, you know, build the foundation of marketing. Is, is that fair? That's very fair. Yes, I would much rather blaze a new trail than, um, you know, pick up where there's a lot of established rules. And this is a clear way that we do things. I want to, um, I'm a builder. I, I like to rely on my creativity I don't want to just follow a rule book. I want to f- write the rules and, and uh, look at things for, from new angles and, and try things that are a little out of the box. So. so what was the PR star? Was this sort of a similar role where you're going out public speaking or is this more managing press relations? Uh, not any public speaking. It was, it, it was kind of crazy because I knew nothing about gaming, casino gaming, poker, nothing like that. Um, they had, I, I think, a couple hundred applicants if I don't if I recall, but there was just something where they just, they knew based on my experience that I would be able to figure it out. And they literally had nothing. They were um, surviving, but not thriving. They were kind of a regional brand. They didn't have a marketing list. They didn't have a marketing strategy. They were based in Minnesota. So far from the glitz and the glamour of Las Vegas. And yeah, uh, yeah, they, they just, they were off the radar. So we had to kind of figure out how do we make this relevant and uh, start yielding up to bigger, better events. We just figured it out. It was, uh, the early years were mostly about like list building. And I would recommend for advisors to kind of start there too. Like you need someone to, to uh, message to, right? So we captured every single email address that we could. They had nothing when I started. We captured email addresses for people that, that played in the tour, but also for press. Anybody who was writing anything about poker, we started press list and we just kept building it and snowballing it and uh, eventually we made it we actually by the time I left we produced more televised poker tournaments than any other company in the world wow that yeah. is because there's some big there's some big companies doing poker tours <laughs> there are yes uh, we actually made it to the biggest uh, card room in the world where we filmed so that was uh, it, it felt like a big accomplishment it was uh, a lot of fun to it just see it take off and and be nobody to all of a sudden we're one of the biggest. So it was cool. You you say list building, but like where do you really start? You know, I mean, you walk into a situation where you have a company uh, and advisors, you know, may feel this way where you you've started your firm, you have you know some clients, you're growing, you're trying to decide you know your next moves and how you want to continue to grow, and you know you want to build your list. I mean, where does that process actually start? Well, for me, it actually started with literally capturing everybody. And I think that that's um, one method of marketing that a a lot of people don't realize that's okay to do, like capture Mm. every email address, um, opt everybody in and let them opt out. That that's where you grow your list. So if they downloaded something from the site or visited us for any reason, we captured them, we market to them and they can opt out. Yeah. Now to be clear, because we had a, we had a little bit of a situation. Uh, Carl Richards spoke at our first conference at XYPN 15. And he said, you know, basically email the people that you know, and and what people heard was just go, you know, find people's email addresses and oh. start emailing them. <laughs> so I want to be very clear. That is spam. That's spam. Not advocate yes. spam. <laughs> no, no, they, absolutely. They have to come into your universe and want something that you have basically. So for example, at XY Planning Network, we have um, what we call lead magnets or freemiums where they would um, visit our website. We give them an offer. Um, like our our first year budget template or our compliance guide or whatever it is, some good quality content that would be helpful for them. And we capture their their email address that way. 
Yeah. So you have to get someone to say, here is my email address. That's now, right. there are admittedly gray area times where, you know, someone signs up for the conference and you have to make the decision, okay, does that mean we can, you know, market and, and include them in our big list? Or is that sort of a subset list? Uh, so there are situations where you, you know, you can make some of those calls as you go, but, but yeah, they need to raise their hand and say, please email me. Uh, but to your point, there's so many times in, you know, in the poker tour was probably experiencing this before you came along where people were raising their hand and saying, you can email me, but, but you weren't, you know, and so getting there is, is a big deal. Absolutely. Yes. And that's, uh, I, when I talk to people about their marketing, that's usually one big misstep that they're making is that people are, are giving their email addresses and there's, they're not nurturing, they're not continuing to follow up. Yeah, people, like you said, people can always opt out and you should use an email marketing system that allows opt out and make it easy. None of this BS, you know, That's right. reply with a subject line that says remove me and then it, and it takes 15 days to process. Like, no, that should be immediate. Um, every single valid, you know, email marketing system out there can do it. But but you were just gathering emails. So then how did you, I guess, what do you do with that email list? I know we're sort of bouncing between career and, and tips, but I don't know what this one goes. So like, how, what do you do with an email list? Like whether you've got 100 people or 10,000 people on it? Sure. It's about nurturing. Um, just like we do at XY Planning Network, we have a newsletter that we would send out that has good, relevant information. And they continue to, to click and get a little bit deeper into the funnel based on that newsletter that they get. Um, for example, at XY Planning Network, we'll invite them to a call or, or some virtual event that they can come to. And they just continue to get emails of hopefully something that's valuable to them. So when they do make that decision that, uh, that, that they could get some value from something like XY Planning Network, they know what we're all about. So were there any other particularly effective marketing strategies that, that you focused on when you were with the poker tour that, that you found uh, were beneficial in helping to grow the company? There was. And, you know, I've never heard of anybody else doing this. And I, I think it probably came from my perspective of not having been in the, in the space or in the industry and just trying something that hadn't been done before. But it was really effective for us to do what I call a faux press release. So if, if you've ever put a, a press release out on the wire, it's kind of an expensive proposition, right? Yeah, to pay for a wire service, it's a, a minimum of $800 for 400 words. And if you pay a PR company to help you with that, you're talking three to $5,000. Exactly. So we had a lot of things that we wanted to put out as news, upcoming events, uh, you know, when we would announce a new event, a new tour stop to the schedule or a tour stop that had just happened and the results of that and who won and how much money and that sort of thing. Uh, but we certainly couldn't afford to put it on the wire every time. But we would still write it up in a newsworthy voice in it we would we would write up a press release and then we would distribute it to our press list and in some cases our player list um, even though it was written as a press release it uh, they were always very well written and that helped too so sending it to our press list was incredibly effective for us because everybody needed content right everybody needed mm. all of these publications needed something to, to fill the pages, whether it was print or online, they always need a good quality content. So a lot of times they would just reprint these press releases exactly as we had written them <laughs> word for word. And it worked. Like we really started getting a lot of attention from that. And I think the players, even though they were getting something that looked like a press release instead of something that looked like regular email marketing, uh, they almost paid more attention to it because it looked like they were getting this breaking news. More official. Yeah, it was more official looking. And, uh, and that worked. We put out, I'd say, maybe two to four press releases a month and had just really good luck doing that. That's a great idea. I mean, it, and it really comes down to the fact, though, that you knew the the reporters to email. Uh, and this sort of goes back to, and, and we can dig in a little bit more uh, around having that having that ideal client profile, having that avatar or that niche, uh, is that you knew the reporters that were talking or that were writing about poker tours, right? Like you, you weren't emailing like random personal finance reporter at the New York Times, you know, because that wasn't your person. Exactly. And then the second piece to that, when we would be out and about um, on tour stops as we would invite journalists or sometimes even just bloggers that we knew were in the area to come out and really started building relationships. And that served us so well through the years. It was really the, the relationships, I'd say, that, that propelled us to the next level. 
Yeah, I mean, earned media is a huge catalyst. I mean, for any advisor that that missed it, I mean, we um, were fortunate enough to have Ron Lieber of the New York Times write an article uh, about XY Planning Network, sort of featuring the monthly subscription service model and and some of our advisors. And I mean, our website, you know, a week and a half, two weeks later, is still blowing up with traffic from that. And and that wasn't something we paid for. We didn't. Uh, that is a relationship that we've had for a long time. And we actually invited Ron to speak at our national conference. And, you know, just mentioned how many advisors would be there. And he couldn't speak because of ethical reasons at the at the New York Times. But that was sort of the catalyst for like, oh, I didn't realize y'all had grown so much. There must be something here. And so he wrote that article. Uh, earned media is a is a wonderful marketing tool, but it is a long play, right? Like that's not a send a press release, get five clients kind of thing. It, it's yes, it's a long play, but it keeps delivering. I mean, it like you said, it's been a couple of weeks now since that article came out. And it's yeah, our website has been popping. Obviously, good for the advisors because we we see a lot of uh, obviously a lot of consumer traffic coming in looking for an advisor. Uh, we've heard quite a few have gotten that, but uh, you know if you have a niche market, and, and I know I've talked to some advisors. We've had a couple on the show that actually do print advertising and and you know actually have a, a clearly defined enough niche that they have a group of reporters that that you can email with that information. And if you can cultivate that, uh, whether it be locally or nationally, depending on your niche market. Again, huge potential dividends if uh, if that's the direction that you want to go. Absolutely. And then again, it comes back to establishing your authority, right? I mean, at the end of the day, that's what you need to convert clients. So it's, it's the perfect plan. Any other uh, particularly valuable or, or effective marketing strategies that, that you learned there? Yeah, I think that was really the big one that was really unique for us. Um, of course, we had the benefit of TV. So we we had that channel um, where we could put in our own commercials and and that was very valuable to us. And then another um, reason why I saw us succeeding is a lot why I see XY Planning Network succeeding. It's because it was just good people. And that that's everything. Like being on the right side of that and and working just with really good people, um, people take notice of that. and, And that goes a long way for establishing your authority. So you were at the poker tour, you said, for six years. Um, and then sort of as that came to a close, is that when you then made the transition over to, to XY? I did uh, consulting for a couple of years. Um, okay. Yep. I, so what type of consulting? Most of my clients had some sort of a tie to gaming because I, I took uh, my relationships that I had built in my time with the poker tour. And as I was kind of weighing my next opportunity, I had several friends in the industry that said, I, I I'd like you for this, or I'd like you for that. And I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. So I thought I'll just hodgepodge this together as a consultant and try a bunch of different things. I knew that I I needed to diversify a little bit with some change in legislation in the industry. It was the poker industry was getting really tough. So I wanted to diversify a little bit. Um, For example, I had a client that had a uh, software for poker rooms. I almost immediately realized that was a misstep for my career. I did not enjoy consulting. That's tough. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't enjoy it. Um, it was a great opportunity to try a lot of different things and and to experiment um, with marketing. But I just I didn't have the the passion for any one client that I really that fuels me. So. I started thinking about, okay, where am I really going to dig in? Um, and I had a, a list of things that I was looking for and XYPN checked all of my boxes. And if I remember right, you saw a job posting that we posted on angel.co, which I didn't even know that was a website. Um, is that right? That it was on angel? It was. Does that? Yep. Okay. Uh, the only reason I knew about it was because our, I believe, Carolyn McRae, our marketing coach who lives in Boston, had told us to, had recommended posting it there. If it wasn't Carolyn, it was someone had said, oh, you should post here. And we're like, what is this website? Uh, and so we posted there. And, and you know, I, I swear if we posted 100 jobs, we would not find another gen. <laughs> However, uh, when recruiting, uh, cast that net as wide as you can because you, you never know who's going to find you on a very, I would say obscure. It was obscure to me. Apparently, it's huge. Uh, it is a very effective website for recruiting. Is it huge? I don't know. I recommend it all the time. Know. And uh, most people have never heard of it, but but they love it. It's a little bit different because you, you put everything that a candidate would want to know about a job, which is what we do at XYPN anyways, right? Um, but for the applicant, they, they are blessed with so much information about the job. I feel eliminates a lot of waste time uh, because you... You know, a little you, more you empowered. Have, 
Exactly. On both sides. So um, it, it's a great platform. I like yeah, it. We, we could do an entire episode on on posting a job. Uh, please, yes. please just post the salary that you're going to yes. hire at. Just put it out there. <laughs> and that's what yes. that's what you're mentioning about Angel, because it, it's it says like, is there a salary? Is there equity? Is there like, where is it located? How many hours? Like it, it gets into a lot of nitty gritty details. It doesn't just let you post like a blanketed, you know, call us for information kind of thing. Right. And you definitely, when you're going through the hiring process, you want a candidate who's ready to go that they, they know what the, what the terms are. I think um, that's helped us as we've worked on hiring up in our marketing department. I, I want somebody who's, who knows what they're getting themselves into. I completely agree. And that's, I feel like people posting jobs, it's it tend to forget the pain of interviewing for jobs. Uh, it's like, you know, we will all talk crap about the hiring managers or the people that we've interviewed with until we're the one on the interviewer side. And it's just like, we do the same things that they all did to us. So um, again, we have some content coming out about that. We have a whole a conference or a retreat for our uh, experienced members that uh, called Accelerate that, that's going to be hosted here in Bozeman at the end of March uh, to actually specifically talk about the hiring process. So we, w- we won't have to dig into it too much today. But but so you made the transition over to XY back in October of 16 now. Yeah. Try to get my dates right. And, you know, this was a sort of a situation where we had, we had some content marketing going, had some things that were out there. Um, but I think the big thing that you did, which I'd love to hear more about, is sort of plugging the holes Yes. So, you know, if you think about a funnel and we talk about marketing funnels, it, you know, sometimes funnels, it, it can look like the one where you pour oil into and it actually goes where it needs to, uh, or it can look like a colander. And our, we sort of had a hodgepodge of technology, which I think led to sort of the colander effect. But talk about sort of your, if you will, sort of plugging the whole process and, and the effect that that has. Had. Yeah, absolutely. I was very blessed when I started in this position that there was already so much good content and y'all had already produced so many great tools and lead magnets and, and blogs and of course the podcast and um, all of the pieces were there. All I really had to do is string them all together, which has been big. And I, I think that that's probably one area where if someone's dropping the ball in marketing or they're, it, it's just not clicking for them, it might be because of that. They, they don't have it all kind of strung together. And I guess the high level way to look at that is to make sure that everything you're putting out there leads to the next step in the funnel. So it's really helpful to visualize your funnel and you, know, you can break it down into the various phases. There's the awareness phase and interest and capture and kind of know what tools and what resources you need at each point and then make sure that there's a clear line from one to the next. And and that's where we were kind of we were kind of dropping the ball yeah. at XY Planning Network a bit is we would have these great freemiums and people would exchange their email address for them and they were clearly interested uh, and we would provide that freemium and then they we would kind of just they would drop off and we weren't continuing to nurture them. So that's been that's been a big change for us. So we increased our funnel dramatically, our our, our pipeline of prospects. Yeah. And, and I, it's obviously fair to say that now XY, you know, we have grown to the point that our, you know, marketing budget uh, is is obviously larger than what most advisory firms, uh, particularly if, if you're, you know, a one to three person shop are, are going to be willing to invest. Uh, but I do think we have learned so much uh, about what works and what doesn't work and and just how important the fundamentals and the basics are. And that is something that doesn't require a big budget right. to implement. And, and exactly what you're talking about, which is worry less about producing 10 freemiums. Be sure the one that you have connects. That's right. And that when, you know, when someone downloads it, you're actually emailing them weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, whatever your schedule is, and that you don't end up with uh, you know, these email addresses sitting out in no man's land, just sort of off your radar because, you know, you sort of forgot about them. So, be you know, sort of work on optimizing over, you know, just producing more. That's right. Yeah. And, and take the stuff that you are producing and do more with it. Yeah. That is something I want to talk to you about because this is an area where um, we get caught always trying to produce more content. And I am so the guiltiest <laughs> one when it comes to this. Cause I'm like, let's have 15 lead magnets this year and we'll write a new book and we'll, we'll ramp up the podcast. We'll have other people, you know, being uh, hosting on the podcast. So let's make it a daily thing. Uh, and, and you and, and Michael are always reeling me back in on that because the truth is there is 
a, a time at which you have enough content and you need to be leveraging right. the content because the truth is producing content is really hard. So let's talk about producing content for, for the folks that are out there that are not yet in the position of wanting to do a daily one hour <laughs> podcast because uh, they have so many ideas. What do you recommend to advisors that are trying to get started? I mean, is the blog really where it starts or is it some other medium that you recommend? Uh, yeah, I, I, I feel like advisors might groan when I say blogging. I really think that that's the most logical place to start. You'll get the most um, for your efforts if you start with a blog. And it, not everybody is a natural born writer. So I, I understand the pain when they hear that that's really step one, but it's so good for so many reasons. Uh, you know, one, it just helps you get your, your thoughts down and um, it helps you really just lay out that valuable content that uh, that your prospects will come to you for and then you can go in lots of diff different directions once you have that that single blog yeah and listeners have heard me say i am a terrible writer i, I really am not good and and it just takes me a long time and it takes a lot of energy to actually produce content and so step one is defining your topic which i guess we could even take a step back from here but but step one is actually coming up with a topic and and what you want to say uh, the second part is actually saying it, which is the part that is more easily outsourced uh, to an expert. And so that that is something that I have learned is that, you know, writing is a skill. Uh, some people are born with a gift, but uh, it is a it is a learned skill that is honed over time. And so you can go out and hire a writer, but it needs to be your idea, your words, your content that's coming out. Someone else is just writing it for you. That's right. Or if uh, writing isn't that painful, but it's editing where you really need help. Uh, you can outsource your editing. There's just so many ways to go about it. it it's probably painful, even for those that are more talented writers, it's still a, a big time commitment. So I, I get that. Um, that's why I recommend doing more with that content once you do write it, because it's that, you know, you're putting so much effort into that original blog. But on the plus side, it will continue to produce for you in perpetuity, right? Once you put it out there, you know, unlike, Absolutely. you know, renting a, a park bench and putting your photo on it, <laughs> that's only going to produce for you as long as you're paying for your photo to be on that park bench. But your blog will just continue to deliver for you forever. And advisors ask all the time, you know, what do I write about? You know, this is that writer's block where you sit down and you think like, do we does the world really need another Roth IRA conversation or, or another blog post on, you know, that you should save into your 401k? And so is this sort of where you know, I guess the, the niche conversation comes yep. in that you really have to know who you're writing to. Exactly. I, I tell people to visualize your ideal client sitting down at their computer in front of Google and asking Google a question like what, what do your ideal clients have questions about? And you might know that just from your other ideal clients uh, who have asked questions just uh, after you have a client meeting, jot down some of their questions, if one person had that question, there's a good chance that other ideal clients out there are going to want to hear you address that same thing. So start there. I always say start with a list because I think it's a little bit easier to break down the writing if the writing is the painful part. Um, you know, think of you know, five ways to do this or top 10 things you haven't considered about that. And then just kind of tackle each section. That's my thought as well. Is I mean, one, obviously, you have to know who you're talking to. And you have to talk to a individual, not a group of people. And I think that's the other hard thing uh, for advisors at times is that we try to write like, you know, well, there's my ideal client is a, is a, I don't know what profession, a young professional. So I'm going to write to young professionals. And it's like, no, like, what are you going to say to that group of people? Instead, like, you know, just like you did back in the day uh, when you were doing PR work for the colleges, you know, you're talking to a group of high school students. And so you can give them content if there had been career changers that were coming in and, and trying to decide if they want to go back to school, it would have been a different presentation and, and maybe even the same core content, but the, the story would have been that's different. That's right. Yep. So that's where the, the niche is very helpful to know. The more focused you can get in and delivering something that's really valuable to your ideal client, um, the better your results are going to be. So do you have a recommendation on frequency and or word count when it comes to producing content that advisors should be aiming for? I think a lot of our advisors try to write once uh, once a week. I've, I thought that was a lot. Yeah. Have you yeah. noticed that uh, most 
Once a week would be great. If you can't do once a week, twice a month, something is better than nothing. Uh, as far as word count goes, they are now saying, the experts are saying that Google prefers longer, uh, longer form blogs, like 3,000 words. I say that just with a, a, a little hesitant because it's always better to be concise and it's always more about the quality than the word yes. count. So, um, but if you can, you know, don't, don't hold back. Longer is better. Yeah, the, it's a fair point that you don't want to get unnecessarily wordy and make it unreadable. Right. Uh, as, as much as I love uh, Michael, I would not recommend writing, you know, four to six thousand word Michael hits his post because many of us skim his content and go back to it when we need it. We use him more as much of a resource as a initial like I found him on Google and I read this whole blog post uh, because that's his style and that's his marketing, uh, which absolutely works. I don't know that advisors are trying to build that level of right. of expertise and out there. Uh, so it's okay to do, like I said, you, you can do long form and, and long form means maybe you're not answering one question. Maybe you're answering, you know, 10 retirement myths that, you know, doctors are getting wrong or I don't know, something like that, that, that then you can, you know, you can make it 15 myths if you need some extra words. I think the point being no more five, three to 500 word blog posts, because that's what we used to do was post every day, three to 500 words. And that's how you won Google. Uh, Google hates right. that now. So the longer form is better, but, but frequency that, that you think it's sort of whatever frequency you can actually commit that's to right. and keep yep. up. With some consistency. And then the other thing that I, I think is really important that a lot of people miss, I still see it quite a bit, is the blog title. You really want to uh, you want the the title to speak to what the content is about. So I see people trying to be kind of intriguing about their title, and mm. it doesn't it, it it's not going to serve them when that ideal customer is sitting in front of their computer googling their question, and they're going to get this you know kind of bizarre title that doesn't really describe what the content is about. So I think that that's that's a really important thing not to overlook. That's interesting. That's more of like a social media clickbait yeah. type titling whenever you go more intrigue. So you're saying if it's 10 retirement myths, it's, you know, the, the title should be, you know, 10 retirement myths. It shouldn't be like, what things are you getting wrong? Exactly. Or, know, yep, yep. Like it's that. just not the time to be intriguing. Just make, and you want your keywords in your title and um, really it, you want to give them enough in the title to make them want to read it. How important is things like, or, or I'd say are things like keywords in the title or in the, the post because it used to be you know that you pick a keyword for the for the post and my keyword is going to be Roth IRA and I'm going to say Roth IRA at least 17 times to be sure that that Google knows this is an article about Roth IRA. Um, obviously, they have improved over time. So, I mean, how important is it to just include all of the keywords and really focus on that, or should it just be you know right for the quality of the content? And the keywords yeah, right for the come? quality of the content. And actually, the the newest philosophy in marketing is that keywords aren't that important. Um, in fact, you know, we use HubSpot at XYPN and they're um, doing away with their keyword functionality with the, yeah. Oh, really? um, that's how that's unimportant, how it, unimportant is. it is now. <laughs> There's a whole new way of doing things <laughs> again, which now I have to learn. But yeah, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't get too hung up on keywords. Yeah, it's, I think, still relatively important to in, include them. Just you know, make sure that you um, are hitting the right notes, but it's not the end all be all. So we've alluded to this a couple of times, but uh, what is most challenging at times is is producing the content. I mean, producing it the first time. And while sometimes I get on my, you know, hey, let's go two or three for five times a week with the podcast. Uh, the question Michael always asks me is, you know, is it better to spend what is essentially two hours of my time prepping and recording and then doing the follow-up and everything that, that goes into a podcast plus all of your time and, and everybody else's time that has to go into to, to you know what it takes to turn this into an actual episode and the money for our producers. Or should you spend that two hours and some of that money sharing the content you've already created? <laughs> exactly. I, yeah, I think that would be the, the road that I would go down for sure. Take that content that you've already created and see if you can really get it out there. And that's uh, a good reason why uh, another point to, to mention is make sure that content is evergreen. So you won't see a lot of blogs on XYPN about um, the holidays or tax season. You'll see some of those, but 
for the most part, we write things mm-hmm. that are evergreen so that we can keep pushing it out and pushing it out and pushing it out. Yes. Yeah, so what are ways that you see, uh, I guess, how are we doing it at XY? And then how does that apply to advisory firms on how they're sort of leveraging those the, that content they're already producing and getting more mileage, I guess, out of it instead of sort of the one, sure. one and done? I, I think when it comes to one and done, one of the uh, common mistakes that we see with uh, social media, we all know that we need to push our blogs out, right, through Twitter or Facebook or whatever. Um, but what a lot of people sure. don't realize is that you, you can do that more than once. Because you, you, know, you have to think of social media as being kind of this flowing river that's constantly moving. And if you just post your latest blog once, there's a good chance you're going to miss most of your audience. So um, there's you know nothing stopping you from taking that blog and pulling several different quotes out of it and scheduling some social media in advance for the next several months promoting that same blog. Is there a limit to how often you can do that? Because I've certainly seen the people that share you know the same tweet feels like 84 times. Uh, oh, right. And I don't know why it always shows up on my, but like, is there a, is there like a, a good number or rule of thumb around like, you know, schedule out daily for a certain number of days and then, you know, every other week or something like that? I, you know, I don't know if there's a rule of thumb. I, uh, it should be like based on how many followers you have, right? If you only have 14 followers and you're reposting the same blog over and over, um, that's probably not going to go well. But if you have thousands of followers, you could keep um, reusing that. And we have so much content at XYPN that we could, you could just keep spreading it out. If you're, if you're talking, you know, one blog or two blogs in your arsenal, it's probably not going to be enough, but build up your arsenal and then um, dig into your archives and, and pull those out. Yeah. So that's another time consuming piece is going back and pulling a, an article you wrote a year ago and, and tweeting about it. Do you have any tools that you recommend for sort of handling some of the, the distribution and sharing of content that you found effective? Sure. Uh, that is one thing that you could outsource. I'll, I'll uh, mention you could get a college intern or something to help you with that. But um, as far as tools, we've used Meet Edgar at XYPN. Uh, we've used Hootsuite for scheduling. Uh, I think there was a somewhat recent change. I think it was with our, our Facebook groups where we can now schedule out our posts in advance. We use HubSpot, so we're able to, to do that. We can schedule posts for any time in the future. Uh, I think right now we have 350 posts in queue that are scheduled to go out. I know. So we Holy try and work God. ahead when we can. Yeah. And we mentioned HubSpot. Uh, For most advisors, HubSpot is overkill. Uh, I will tell you that HubSpot does have a free tool, which is actually really cool. I recommend that you go sign up for HubSpot uh, and just install this tracker on your website because you'll be amazed at the amount of data you can start pulling. And, and, you know, I, I encourage advisors use XY Planning Network's marketing as a, as sort of a framework for what you're doing, because it has been effective. And, and, uh, you know, in the fact that we do have a very clearly defined niche that we, that we target, um, we could open it up and allow anyone to join for whatever reason, whether they're fee only or, or not, whether they're willing to sign a fiduciary oath or not, CFP or not, you know, we could open it up. But uh, I think a lot of our, our growth and, and the success of our advisors has been because we've maintained a very tight niche. We've produced content for that niche. And then, you know, again, sort of leveraging these various marketing tools to to move them through that funnel. Uh, you mentioned Meet Edgar, which I believe is, I think they have a free version. Hootsuite's definitely free. I think you have to maybe pay a little bit more for, for the ability to schedule. But, you know, you can use some of those tools, but, but I do recommend the HubSpot tracker because that's just a cool way to um, start gathering some information that uh, uh, for people on your site. And what it does is when someone finally gives you their email address, they've, they've read eight blog posts and then they finally give you their email, it will go back and sort of rebuild some of the, that person's profile. And I believe that's all in the free version, uh, just so you can sort of see what people are doing on your website before they contact you. Absolutely. That's where it gets really fun. And and that helps you hone in on your strategy a little bit too, because you can now see clearly what works, um, which blogs are your highest converting. And I, I think on the free tool, you'd probably have to kind of manufacture that data a little bit on the paid version. They present it to you very nicely, but it's all there. <laughs> yep. It's all there. <laughs> exactly. You want to see a company that is amazing at upselling. Uh, that would be HubSpot. 
and and lives their own. They walk the talk uh, in that they actually do inbound marketing and, and everything's yep. content related. But for most advisors, I you know I would assume Mailchimp for for email gathering. It, you know you can do automated uh, freemium delivery and and you know maintain your list there. And I think they're even doing some ads and, and Facebook ads now that you can run through that system. So that's a great lightweight tool that that advisors can learn instead of. Um, Something like HubSpot, we've had to hire consultants and all that. And we didn't do that until we were yeah, well absolutely. In, you know, several years into the business. That's right. We used MailChimp before we used HubSpot. And for the most part, it worked fine. So one of the things I want to ask you was uh, we posted a question on our VIP group. So for any advisor that's out there that that hasn't yet signed up for the VIP group, go to xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP. You can sign up for our private Facebook group. We've got about 1,500 advisors in there now that you know have a lot of conversations, but I had mentioned just for a mailbag episode for Kitsis and I to answer questions. And we had a really great question come in that I, I think is a better question for you uh, than myself or Michael. And it was uh, that you had Patrick Brewer on a podcast. So Patrick Brewer was on episode 130. So you can go to xyplanetwork.com slash 130. Uh, and he is a financial advisor, but also has marketing services. Uh, says, I have found another one uh, that has a strong online marketing and sales funnel to actually implement for prospects. How do you go about evaluating services like this when it can easily run into five figures once the ad budget is accounted for? So we obviously have this in-house now because uh, you are, you're on the team full time, and but we have used some various consultants for different project implementations. How do you recommend to an advisor, especially one that's just a solo or maybe they've got one other person in the firm, they're, they're looking at starting marketing, but they don't know where to start. Like, do you go out and hire a five-figure marketing firm? Is that where you start? I, I, well, I think you have to first look at your pain point. I, I have gotten this question before. People know I do marketing. They're like, I don't get marketing. Can I just like hire someone to do everything for me? And I, I would hesitate a little bit with uh, with that because there are a lot of ways to waste money in marketing. Um, there, <laughs> there's an infinite number of ways to spend money. That is for right, sure. Right. Right. Um, so if, if that's what if you're trying to avoid learning the basics of marketing, first you might want to just learn a little bit. And then figure out where your pain point really is. So if you need help with strategy, you know, you could maybe do a short term commitment on strategy, getting getting that all together. And if maybe blogging is part of your strategy, like we mentioned, you can outsource blogging and get help that way. But at the end of the day, it's all going to come down to the cost of customer acquisition, right? As far as how much you're willing to pay. Yeah, which is something most advisors have never thought about. Uh, I would say it is actually, and, and I love watching Shark Tank when they ask, like, "Well, what's your, you know, uh, your CAC?" You know, and, and it's like customer acquisition costs. And for most advisors, they just know, like, because most of us have grown organically through client referrals, which doesn't cost anything. We spend two percent of our budget on marketing as a industry wide. Um, so we've never really calculated that, but it is, and I think it's going to become much more important as we see referral levels uh, to advisory firms dropping. The growth just through through organic referrals is no longer happening. So that that it does matter. And so talk about just sort of client acquisition costs. I mean, what what does that actually mean and why is it important? Sure. Well, you know, did, take your costs that you're spending on on your whether it's a marketing consultant or, you know, whoever it is that you're using to support your marketing. And how many leads are they delivering and how many leads do you need um, to convert a single client? And those are the kinds of the questions that you want to start answering about your marketing um, before you can really decide, you know, if any sort of commitment is going to be worthwhile for you and, and make sure you know how you're going to measure success and, uh, and have that full transparency so you know, you know, what's, uh, what, what's going to deliver for you at, at an appropriate level. Yeah, and, and it's tough. Do you, you know, if a if an advisor is charging two hundred dollars a month, twenty four hundred dollars a year, uh, we can calculate lifetime value, yep. right? That you know that client. The truth is, they tend to stay almost forever because we have like ninety eight percent retention rates. But let's just say, you know, so we're putting a, a ten or twenty thousand dollar lifetime value on that client because of five to ten year, uh, you know, turnover of clients. Um, how do you decide? You know, I make ten thousand dollars off a client. Obviously, I have to pay all my bills. Uh, and everything. So this client, this new client is worth $10,000. How much can I spend to get that client? Like, how do you make how that do you decision? How do you make that decision? I think it's going to be different uh, for everyone, depending on their circumstances and and how much they have or they can afford to 
to spend and how many clients they can afford to handle, right? Uh, you know, as you look at marketing and how much to invest, well, how many clients do you really need? How many, how, how many prospects do you need to get in the door before you get that client and, um, you know, the, the right size client? And those are the kinds of questions you have to answer before beginning, beginning in an engagement, I'd say. Yeah. And, and we've done ep- uh, episodes in the past just around tracking your data metrics. And this is why it's so critical because, um, you know, we know at XY because Jen and Stacy are awesome and track all of this data, sometimes mm-hmm. very manually, admittedly. Some, you know, we, it's not always easy, but we know how many people come to our website, how many people watch the intro video, how many people have a call with Stacy, and then what percentage of the call uh, of those people that talk to Stacy become members. And the only the way that we can make any valid, you know, uh, investment into marketing or, or, you know, really evaluate success is to monitor that data pipeline. Like you have to have the data. It's so critical. And I think most advisors, that's probably a place they should start is being sure that they even know like what percentage of your prospect meetings uh, turn into clients and what percentage of people that that reach out to you turn into prospect meetings so that you can sort of see where the holes are, where you can be more effective. And, and quite honestly, you know, dumping more, just having a bunch more prospect calls doesn't work if you're not converting them. Exactly. That that's a different kind of problem. You you could have plenty of prospects, but the the problem is in your closing or um, you know at, at the services that you're offering aren't quite resonating with your target market, or there could be other factors. Yeah, and you don't know where it's leaking until you actually you know are tracking uh, all of Absolutely. the various steps of the process. What are the primary questions that you get from advisors, uh, whether it be, you know, XYPN members or, or, you know, when you do Coach's Corner at our conference and, and work one-on-one with some advisors that are attending the conference? I mean, what are the, the, the I guess, the, the primary questions that you're getting from advisors are just around marketing in general that, that you help walk them through? Uh, I, I think I'll hear I'm blogging, but I'm not getting any clients from it. Why? So I, I've heard that and it could be you know, anything from an SEO issue, or they're not nurturing their leads, or they're not getting that blog out there, you know, in enough ways or or connecting it to their audience. I'll hear, I need to spend, or I have a a little bit of a marketing budget, what should I do with it? It's another question. I actually wrote a blog about it for XYPN. If you have a little bit of a marketing budget, what should you do? I think just from what I've seen, make sure you have a good quality headshot. That should be one of your first spends. Um, it seems it's a great point, right? It seems you're selling yourself and it seems kind of obvious, but you would probably be the last one to know if your headshot isn't really holding up. And when I, I you don't have to be a supermodel, but your photo should be one of quality. Cause if it's something that you've probably taken with your iPhone and it looks a little shadowy or a little blurry, it, it just doesn't say quality. Uh, I think you might have a hard time converting clients. It's amazing because people are probably jumping into like Facebook yep. ads and hire a writer. And it's like, take, take a, a good real, photo. Start with quality. <laughs> start there. Yep. Um, so that that's like one of the first things that I recommend. I also like a little bit of a swag budget because I think that that will help with your uh, referral program. It, that's a great way to get clients, right? Um, referral business. So invest a little bit in gifts to your clients, you know, thank you gift here or there, or those kinds of things can go far. Of course, a good website. Uh, but there's so much you can do from a marketing standpoint that really won't cost you much other than a little sweat equity, like blog writing or putting premiums together, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And advisors do ask me, you know, well, how much of my time, especially early on, should be spent on on marketing? You know, I've, I started my firm three months ago. I'm just getting started. How much time should I be spending on marketing? And typically my answer is at least 20% of your time, at least one day a week. Uh, but truthfully, you're probably spending two to three days a week on sales and marketing efforts, whether that's going out networking or um, you know, uh, writing blog posts or meeting with centers of influence, I mean, whatever the thing is, like that's where most of your time gets spent because that's all you have to, that's all you have is time because <laughs> you just started a business. Yes, you have the time. Exactly. And then, like I, I mentioned earlier, that stuff's in your arsenal forever. So produce stuff that will just keep producing for you and you will eventually have to spend less and less time on it. You know, people can go back uh, if they search via YouTube and they can find uh, Serenity Financial Consulting's YouTube channel where I have these just now, I mean, they're just horribly embarrassing 
uh, videos where I just talked to my webcam. I, I would write a blog post and I would basically read the blog post to the webcam. And I was in a very nice shirt sitting in my desk chair and people can go back and look at them. I mean, they're just horrible quality. Um, and what was funny about that was, like you said, I had time producing. I wrote three times a week and did three videos a week. And I was on that schedule for like six months and it was fine. And then eventually I, it tapered off. Um, but what I found was uh, the most effective thing that those videos gave me one SEO because Google yep. loves videos. So uh, having all this video content was awesome. Um, but what was funny was advisors in, in the Milwaukee area were watching the videos and they, and, and they've told me this later and they would say, yeah, we didn't know if like, this was like a new marketing thing. So we were watching them just to see if like, <laughs> should we be doing these? And, and they were having all these conversations come to find out one of the advisors was Paula Hogan, who uh, sent me the vast majority of my uh, client referrals in my first year because she would send me all of her, you know, less than a million dollar clients. And, and it's funny to me that like those videos, I don't know that they actually brought in a single client directly, but Paula saw me on the videos, kept me top of mind. And then when she had a referral to make uh, to an advisor that didn't meet her minimums, she would send them my way. And you just never know how that stuff's going to play out. But, but having that content out there is, is huge. It is. And I actually like the fact that you did that just kind of low budget. I think that's how video works best. It's, uh, it's very genuine. It's very authentic. You don't need a big, you know, flashy studio with a set or anything like that. You can really do this with your iPhone. A lot of the folks in our space, I mean, they charge $1,000 for every 30 seconds is sort of a, a rule of thumb that I've seen. So, you know, if you want a couple minute long clips, I mean, you're going to be out a bunch of money. So you think, you know, iPhone obviously has got a great camera, maybe a lav mic or something just to actually get good audio quality, but that that's sufficient in terms of sort of being authentic. Or um, Facebook Live. We did Facebook Live uh, a couple times at XYPN, and you really don't need any equipment. You can just start recording and go, and you can save that recording and post it forever. Oh, that's a good point. I forgot that you could actually record those. It's not actually yeah, just live. you can record it, and you can do Q&A or do whatever you want, and uh, and then you, you've, you've got this video that uh, you will continue to serve you. And that is a good example of building a community, building a homogenous community that you can speak to, because it's a lot easier for me to jump into our VIP group and do a Facebook <laughs> Live because I know who I'm speaking to as opposed to, you know, if I right. just put it on my normal Facebook, I mean, you know, my my high school friends and college friends see it and they don't care what I'm talking about. Uh, but it it's so important to define your avatar, define the person that you're talking to and, and do things like, uh, you know, we've basically the, the entire purpose of this podcast for anybody that's wondering uh, if you haven't figured out the secret yet, it's to get you to join the VIP community, right? Like that's, this is a lead magnet where we're sharing awesome content. I think it's very valuable. I hope it is. Uh, but the whole point is get you to join the VIP group. And then the point of the VIP group is to allow community building and for us to stay top of mind that if you ever decide to go launch your own firm or build out a next-gen service model at your firm, you know XY Planning Network and you know who we are because you're in our community, you're in our ecosystem. So uh, for anybody that wanted the, the dirty secret of XYP and marketing, this is one of our funnels, right? And, and it works. Now you gave away all my secrets and I'm going to have to come up with new stuff. <laughs> <laughs> if only secrets were, were what we could actually rely on. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So any other, I guess, uh, as we're sort of coming to a close, any other final tips that you would give advisors that are uh, getting, you know, they, they maybe in their first year or two years of business, they're actually starting to spend some money on marketing, sort of where they should be focusing in, in anything else that we haven't covered yet? I think, you know, it's it's really the same story. Focus on your niche and, and think about um, the questions that they have and how you can provide good quality content to them. And however you do it, whatever comes easiest for you, whether it's video or writing blogs or however you want to reach them, um, think it's all about them. It's not about you. It's not about what you have to say. It's about what they want to hear, what, how you can help them, uh, what's relevant to them. And if you can get that down, you can nail marketing. <laughs> And you heard it from the mouth of a director of marketing. <laughs> she says niche, I say niche, same thing. You got to have one. Um, but but you do make a good point that, again, like I'm not, I'm just, I don't enjoy writing. So I prefer to record a podcast. And then we actually have a, a writer now on, on the team that pulls content out of these podcasts and, and creates awesome blog posts. And they're not just transcripts because no one wants to read a transcript. It's terrible. Uh, but we can pull content out of this because out of an hour, I mean, good gracious, we probably say like 25,000 words. I don't know what the actual number is, but it's a lot. 
you know, and so they can pull that out and and turn that into content. And again, it's our ideas, our words, our thoughts said better by a writer because they're just better at communicating through the written word if they have that skill set. And in writers freelance, uh, they don't have to cost you a ton of money. And, and quite honestly, uh, even if they they charge a, a pretty penny per hour, it will take them much shorter amount of time than it will take an advisor. So it's okay to spend money to save time. That's right. That And that's the perfect scenario to get help with marketing to save yourself time. So Jen, as we're sort of wrapping up, I'll, I'll ask you the final question, which um, nobody has ever seen seemingly prepared for. Uh, <laughs> but that is, uh, you know, if you could go back and give, you know, your younger self one piece of advice, sort of one thing you wish you had known then that you've learned uh, that you would, you know, impart upon your younger self, what do you think that one piece of advice would be? I think I would say take more risks. Like, why not take more chances? That's it. The chances I've taken in the chances I've taken in life have all paid off for me. Um, what hasn't paid off is doing the same thing over and over without um, testing new ideas or new new strategies, new ways of doing things. So, yeah. Fantastic. Well, Jen, thank you so, so much for taking the time to come on the show and, and share your expertise when it comes to marketing. Thanks, Alan. Thanks for everything. XYPN is so wonderful. I just so appreciate all of you. Never miss another opportunity due to a missed call. For a special offer, visit callruby.com slash XYPN and use promo code XYPN or call 1-844-853-7829. Be sure to join our VIP community at xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP to hang out with other XYPN radio listeners, ask questions for future mailbag episodes with myself and Kitsis, and to finally find a community of like-minded financial advisors. Thanks so much for joining me today. We'll see you next time. Welcome to XYPN Radio, where your host, Alan Moore, brings you into a community of fee-only financial planners who want to profitably and successfully serve Gen X and Gen Y clients. If you're ready to get the knowledge you need from leaders in your field, learn from forward-thinking advisors, and take action on your own goals, XYPN Radio is the show for you. Here's your host, 